2023. It's been almost three years, and yet the Supreme Court of Canada has yet to weigh in on any of the civil liberties infringements emanating from the pandemic. I guess they're busy with more important things, or maybe they already did weigh in on the matter. As you know, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court early on announced he was imposing a vaccine mandate on Supreme Court staff themselves. So really, he telegraphed to the world before a trial, before a hearing, that uh, his view was vaccine mandates were obviously okay since he was imposing one himself. That is the quality of our justice in Canada. And indeed, the message was heard by all lower courts. To this day, there has yet to be a single substantive civil liberties law or regulation that was struck down. Uh, even though our vaunted Charter of Rights was um, well, it was said to be second only to the Bible in terms of defining what Canadians were. It is therefore with great jealousy that I cast my gaze down to the United States where their courts, even in blue Democrat states, are not shy about striking down overreaching legislation that uses COVID-19 as an excuse. And what I find very gratifying is that when there is a battle in an American court for freedom against a lockdown overreach, odds are you will find our next guest there. I'm talking about our friend Janine Eunice, a lawyer with the new Civil Liberties Alliance. And what a delight to have her on the show today. Janine, great to see you fresh on the heels of a victory in California. Congratulations. Tell our viewers all about it. Oh, thank you so much, Ezra. Thanks for having me on again. Um, so yeah, this was a law that um, prohibited doctors from giving misinformation to patients, disseminating misinformation to patients. And misinformation is de defined as false information contradictory to the scientific consensus and contrary to the standard of care. Sorry, contrary to the standard of care. There's no and in there, which was one of the sticking points. So it's this phrase that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mishmash the whole, you know, standards together. Uh, standard of care, scientific consensus. And when you take into account, of course, that this whole issue has been politicized and the uh, bill's legislative history, which is clearly designed to, shows it's clearly designed to silence doctors who disagree on COVID-related matters, especially max, masks and vaccines, uh, the judge was right to halt it. So this is a preliminary emergency motion, so there's still more work to be done, but it's a really good sign. Well, I, I feel great about it. When you throw in words like COVID-19, and misinformation. You're touching all the buzzwords used for censorship in other parts of society. That's what YouTube says in their, quote, community guidelines. Uh, that's what they use to shut down discussion on social media. So when the legislature of California thought, well, let's just combine those two things, talk about COVID, talk about misinformation, it's a slam dunk. And indeed it was in the legislature, but the judge called the definition of misinformation, if I'm quoting correctly, he called it nonsense, as in he couldn't make heads or tails of it. I, I can see that because really one man's misinformation is another man's truth. One, you know, it, it's, and by the way, we don't quite yet know what all the truths are because let truth and falsehood grapple. We, that all progress depends on revealing new truths that we don't yet know. So the idea that you can de de define what idea is good and what idea is bad in advance by a legislature is so it's the opposite of science janine and yet this was being imposed on doctors exactly and so the state's argument was basically that well doctors have to abide by a standard of care anyway right to prevent medical malpractice lawsuits um, that's a term they're familiar with and there are other uh parts of the california disciplinary code that prohibit uh you know fraud so if you tell a patient that um I don't know, COVID is caused by laser beams. I just heard that in a podcast. I'm stealing from, you know, that would be deception or fraud. The law doesn't protect that. But our argument was, first of all, yes, standard, standard of care is a term in medical malpractice lawsuits, but you're putting it together with the term scientific consensus in a way that, you know, that term is not one that doctors are really familiar with in operating their practices. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. And if the two terms are the same, then why do you have both of them? It seemed to me obvious that what it's trying to do is to make doctors afraid so that they don't say, you know, they don't uh, tell patients, you know, I'm not sure that masks work, uh, which many doctors are asked about, or maybe you don't need the vaccine because you're 15 and you just had COVID. Um, and that's, in fact, what our, the, I'm representing five doctors in the case. And they said they're, you know, those are things that they've said to patients in the past they intend to say in the future. 
but they're afraid to say them now because they think they could be disciplined under the law. And the state attorney actually acknowledged, the judge directly asked her, well, could these plaintiffs be disciplined for the things they're saying? And she said, I don't know. Hmm. And he said, well, that's the problem here. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know, then uh, that shows the law is unconstitutionally vague, which was the um, the argument that we won on at the hearing. Well, I find it so encouraging that a judge would ask just normal judge e questions like that. We haven't seen that in Canada yet. I, um, I, I want to ask, did this law, which is now being temporarily frozen, did it apply only to COVID-19? That's my understanding, which again shows the weirdness to it. I mean, there are many ailments and diseases that there's sort of a traditional or mainstream viewpoint. And then there's always second opinions or alternative treatments or unusual or even desperate treatments. We've all heard of cases where people have tried the tried and true, and they're so desperate, they're going to very unusual treatments. And we know about that. And we typically feel bad for someone driven to such ends. And I'm sure those doctors who have un, you know, unorthodox methods are scrutinized, but only COVID-19 was caught by this, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? That's right. And that was one of our arguments. So we had two separate arguments. One was the vagueness argument, which was what we won on. The other was First Amendment. So the First Amendment prohibits, uh, among other things, the government from censoring people for expressing certain views, disfavored views. And so we were arguing that this was uh, effectively viewpoint discrimination. The judge actually decided, um, for reasons I can only speculate about, not to address that. So he said, I find it vague, so I'm not even going to go to the First Amendment question. Um, but in terms of our First Amendment argument, we said uh, our argument was one of the reasons you know that this is designed to silence doctors who disagree with the state is it's just about COVID. If you're so concerned about misinformation causing death, why aren't you concerned about misinformation with cancer? You know, there are lots of uh, doctors who say maybe you don't need chemo or, you know, who, who embrace alternative treatments for cancer or heart disease. Um, I mean, you have doctors now telling people it's perfectly healthy to uh, donuts are just as good as fruits and vegetables, which I would call misinformation for other political reasons. Um, but the fact that they're targeting COVID shows that this is a viewpoint based law. Um, so I think that's a good argument, and I imagine it'll be addressed on appeal. Yeah. I understand that the California Medical Association actually supported this law, which, if true, is deeply disappointing. I mean, they're supposed to be advocates and champions of doctors. It's sort of like a doctor's union, if it's the same as the Canadian Medical Association. And yet they look like they've been colonized. They're the enforcers, just like in Canada, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which is actually the regulatory body, has been, in fact, in their own way, Janine, imp implementing this California law. They have been suspending or prosecuting or, or um, invest, well, at least investigating any doctor who issued an exemption or spoke out against it or called for alternative treatments like, let's say, ivermectin. But the CMA, why would they support it? Why are, are they just a political creature posing as doctor's advocates? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, that would be my take. All of these organizations, you know, CDC, the California Medical Association, any doctor's associate, association in a blue state has really just become sort of political actors who, and you know, any, they're just um, designed, or at this point, their main goal is just to further a certain viewpoint, which is, you know, COVID restrictions. So I think that's the explanation there. And w one of the interesting things about um, the proponents of this bill was a number of them have threatened my clients on social media saying, you know, we can't wait to get your licenses taken away using AB 2098. So that was another argument we used to say, this is clearly designed to silence doctors who have different views from the state. Um, this isn't a, some kind of benign uh, or reasonable law, you know, preventing doctors from saying that vaccines have a microchip or, you know, will turn you into an alien or something, which I don't think any doctors have ever said anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and other, you know, other parts of the state's business and professions code prevent from them from saying those things. Yeah, it's very crazy. Well, let me ask you this. The CMA was on the other side. Um, you were on the side of the angels. I understand you had five doctors who were your clients. Um, were there other interveners? Were there other people in the court or who submitted briefings to the court one way or the other? Sometimes that's a good barometer of where other civil liberties groups are, where other interest groups are. Was there any other intervention other than the new Civil Liberties Alliance? 
Yeah, so we had amicus briefs. I don't know if you have the same concept or term in Canada, but it's, you know, they're not parties to the lawsuit, but they are they have an interest based on what their organization's mission is. So uh, actually, the ACLU submitted an amicus brief, which is um, somewhat unusual because the ACS is, uh, sorry, the ACLU has been a bit um, absent during the COVID pandemic, one might say. <laughs> so I should and, check with uh, you which side they, on, on whose side they intervene. I should do- double check because I don't know the like, answer. Yeah, that's true. You're right. They're, they haven't just been absent. They've actually embraced vaccine mandates. So they've actually been on the uh, the, the wrong side of this, but they actually uh, filed an amicus brief in support of us um, and made a lot of excellent points, actually. So we were pleased to have their support. Another organization, um, A Voice for Choice, submitted an amicus brief. It's sort of a physician's group that, um, you know, it, actually, I think it's a patient's group that advocates for informed consent. So we had some support. I don't think any, uh, no amicus briefs were submitted in support of the state. So it was nice to have that um, support there. Yeah, well, that's a surprise right there. Well, listen, I, I just, I knew you'd be involved with this case because you in particular have been fighting the good fight on so many COVID-related and lockdown-related battles, including, I remember, professors who were commanded to take a jab even though they had natural immunity and things of that sort. I think you're really fighting the good fight. Let me ask you one last question before I let you go. In Canada, most of the mandates are gone. Not all, but most. And I think a lot of the tickets and cases are you know, not being prosecuted. They're sort of aging out and they'll just sort of wither on the vine. I think a lot of the more spectacular charges were just to scare people into compliance. They wanted it to look so brutal out there, be so, uh, to make people afraid to go out. I mean, I mean, uh, some of the enforcement, I think, was literally designed to, to create shock in the community, to scare people to stay home, to scare people to not travel. So the abusiveness of it was actually the point of it. And now that prosecutors have to take these tickets and charges to court, I think a lot of them are saying, yeah, in the cold morning uh, after the the wild party last night, I don't know if I want to go to a judge with this. I guess what I'm saying is in Canada, I sense a lot of cases are just going to be stayed or dropped. At least I hope that's the case. What's it like in America? Are there lots of cases out there or are there lots of is this a current issue in, for example, in some of the blue states, are they still banning people who are not vaxxed from working in hospitals or, or government or the military? Yeah, there's some of that. Most of the government mandates aren't in effect so much. Uh, there are definitely still some employee mandates, some college uh, booster mandates. That's one thing I hear a lot about. Hmm. Um, there are even some mask mandates, especially for kids in some of the blue states, um, so, and uh, not a lot of private organizations. So I, th- I was just reading, I think, that the Broadway somewhere is still requiring masks. So there's still some of this. Um, the lawsuits are actually getting a little bit more successful. Like there have been some recent vaccine mandate successes that I think wouldn't have been successful a year or two ago, because I think courts are starting to see, okay, this is ridiculous. And yeah. Even though the law is the same, it's the, the, honestly, you know, the facts that the landscape has changed, especially now we know that the vaccine doesn't stop transmission. Yeah. And I think some of the judges have sobered up a little bit. I think some of the judges were honestly terrified. I mean, judges That's generally exactly. are older people who, who may have been more, they're, they're absolutely trusters of authority. They love authority. They live in authority. So I think of all the people to adjudicate these matters, scared judges, part of the establishment who, uh, like other experts such as themselves, were probably the most uh, lockdown friendly people in society. And I think that they have sobered up a little bit over the years. Janine, great to see you again, folks. She's fighting for freedom with the new Civil Liberties Alliance. Look forward to your next battle, my friend. Thank you so much. commonality between our two stories today? Well, it's pretty easy to see. The government banning ideas they don't like by calling your ideas misinformation and disinformation, but certainly not their ideas. They're never wrong. And when they are, it's your fault or it was all in good faith. You're never right, even if your fears turn out to be true, as so often happened during the lockdown. In California, they tried to actually pass a law banning misinformation, but the judge found the definition to be nonsense. How can you tell if something is true or not in a piece of legislation? It's like when 
Justin Trudeau banned rebel news from the leaders' debates, he couldn't come up with any criteria that would allow them to ban rebel news, but let in the CBC or the Toronto Star or some left-wing publications like, say, the Narwhal or, or, or the Tai, because they literally could not describe rebel news and what they hate about us in a way that doesn't touch half the rest of the media. Same thing with misinformation. What Justin Trudeau calls misinformation can only be explained based on him, what he doesn't like, what he says you shouldn't believe. There is no way to define it in an objective sense. Anyone who uses the word misinformation or disinformation with you, or even fact check, which every journalist should be, anyone who uses that lingo with you, well, they're the misinformationists. That's our show for today. Until tomorrow, on behalf of all of us here at Rebel World Headquarters, to you at home, good night. And keep fighting for freedom. Thank you.